Good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange, the Native Plant Project, and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Pollinator Friendly Forbs to Seed for the Sagebrush Step, presented by Jim Kane with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Before I introduce our presenter, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field the questions for the presenter after the presentation, but it helps us if you type questions during the webinar so that we have some ready in the queue. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Jim Kane is a research entomologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service Pollinating Insect Research Unit at Utah State University in Logan. Jim has worked with pollination and pollinators of many crop plants and native wildflower seed crops used for restoration. He has published research on native bee nesting biologies, chemical ecologies, foraging ecologies, floral specializations, community dynamics, and conservation, and is currently multiplying five species of native osmia bees for these applications. Current research includes responses of resident native bee communities to recent wildfire, a chrono sequence of big Great Basin fires, and experimental demonstration of heat tolerances of bee life stages. Welcome, Jim, and thank you for presenting today. Thank you, Jenny. So I will start here. Yeah. Um, and you the presenter. Ah, yes. And there's show my screen. Mm -hmm. and Perfect. So that up. Yep. It occurs to me uh, my talk will be for restoration purposes or rehabilitation purposes and pollination and plants for the Great Basin. But if some of you want to know about garden plants suitable for Great Basin, especially choosing amongst natives or not natives, ones that will feed bees, I can post to you uh, a site for that also. I have a compilation of such information. But for today, we're going to talk about native bees, native forbs, and how to favor them in the Great Basin. If I can get this to go forward. There. So I will start, as it says there, with a brief overview of bee life histories. And I will do that because most all of our bees are solitary, not social bees, the exception being bumblebees and some sweat bees. And so therefore, understanding how a honeybee life history goes will be quite different from our native bees. I'll then go over some of the more common native wildflowers I've been working with and their valued native bee communities. and among which ones native bees like and what their versatility is for use. And then as a treat at the end, I will show you how to identify or recognize some of the genera of native bees that you'll encounter commonly in the Great Basin that are also recognizable. When I first started work here, I was familiar with bloom or the lack of it along the interstate corridor from Salt Lake City to Reno in the middle of summer and thought that the Great Basin was a rather dismal place. I've since been corrected for that by getting out of that corridor and exploring around in May at, mid at lower to mid-elevations in June up in the mountains and been rewarded by scenes like this one with penstemon, senecio, all sorts of things flowering spectacularly. We also are rich in bees. We don't have a species count for the Great Basin, but if you take Utah's fauna, which is quite well known because this lab has been involved with it for 60 years, we have about a thousand species of native named species of native bees in Utah. And that's a big portion of what's available in the US. And if you're familiar with birds, you know that's a lot more species of bees than birds in our state or in the country. Let me take you through the life cycle of what these solitary bees look like. Most of our solitary bees have a single generation per year, the ones in the Great Basin in particular. And so what you're going to see is the life of an individual bee starting with an egg. 
which you can see on the right hand side of that pollen provision mass in the picture. The egg stage is rather brief, although there's all sorts of activity going on inside the egg as the embryo develops and does a flip inside the egg. The first, the first stage of the larva actually lives within the, the corian of the egg, but it soon emerges from that as a second instar larva. It's a white, blind grub. It's legless. It's in, relatively immobile, and it sits inside of the cell made by its mother and eats the provision of pollen mixed with nectar over a period of about a month. The vast part of its lifespan is spent in a resting stage. For a lot of our bees, it's a larva that's finished feeding, does one last molt and looks like this. It just looks like a larva. Other ones, some of the spring bees, will then transform, usually inside a cocoon, to pupate and then as an adult and spend the winter as an adult inside the cocoon. But most of them pupate the following year. Unlike moths and butterflies, no bee overwinters in the pupal stage. It's always a short stage, not a resting stage, and it's a very delicate stage. And it looks like a bee carved out of wax. And then to make the cycle complete, what you get to see flying around is the adult stage, which is rather brief. So when you see a bee flying around and someone asks you how old it is, well, the adult may only be a few weeks old, but that adult originated as an egg the year before for all of our solitary bees. Most of our solitary bees in the Great Basin, and indeed in most habitats around the world, nest underground. Each mother bee makes, chooses her own site. She's independently mated. She digs her own nest. She defends it. She works it inside to make it suitable for raising her progeny. And all you're going to see is a very cylindrical hole with a little mound of soil called a tumulus around it. A substantial minority of our bees will use um, holes left by wood-boring beetles in dead wood. Picture down the right, one of those kinds of beetles, a longhorn beetle on the left, is one of the common ones that makes big holes like that. The other one are the Buprestids or metallic wood boring beetles. And after those beetles have emerged from the dead wood through that hole, bees will use those holes for nesting. A smaller minority still are twig nesters. In the upper picture there is a twig nest from sumac. Some of these bees like to use a pre existing hole, like what you'll see if you cut a forsythia stem. Other ones like to have a pithy stem where they can chew out their own hole, like you can see in elderberry or in sumac. And a very few, like carpenter bees, which you're going to see down in the southern part of the Great Basin, will actually chew into wood or into woody-like substrates. That particular one in the lower left was chewed into a past, an old dried flowering stalk of agave. A very few of our bees make freestanding nests against rock surfaces or in culverts. This is a laborious process, especially for this bee, Dianthidium, who uses tree resin or plant resin with pebbles stuck into it. How it handles that without getting stuck like a tar baby, I don't know. It's very slow and of course it's very prone to being stolen by a member of its species while it's away. So you won't see these very often. If you do see them, photograph them because they're not seen very often. Recently, there's some documentation coming out of several species of bees in this, this genus who nest in soft sandstone. And you can see, if you see opportunities like this, you should photograph them and watch to see if they're still active. And just very recently, two years ago, I found a bee was nesting in a cow pat, very dry cow pats over in western Wyoming. The soils usually nest shallowly in the soil, but in this case, a cow pat was just as good, but that's a new observation. So there's a roundup of the nesting habits of our solitary bees, which is very different from a honeybee or even a bumblebee. And realize that the majority are going to be in the soil, which means we don't have a way of altering or improving nesting habitat for them or moving them around. We only know this for a few faunas because you have to know the entire fauna first and then have a good enough list of reports of where they nest. And so 
the place we know best is the eastern U.S. And there we know that a large fraction of the bees are ground nesters, like you see pictured here. I do know it for a number of the pollinator, what we'll call guilds, the groups of bees who work a particular flowering species that I've been working with out here in the Great Basin. And what you can see from the sort of soil-like fill on most of those histograms, which indicates ground nesting, some of these, like the biscuit roots, all of their pollinators are ground nesters, nearly all of them on the prairie clovers. On the penstemons, there's that wasp in the lower right corner, a pollen wasp who's solitary. That's not a yellow jacket, who are specialists on penstemon and make freestanding nests of mud. But most of them are ground nesters. And this raised a question for us because of the increased frequency and magnitude and intensity of fires in the Great Basin as, sage as cheatgrass becomes better established, is what about the fates of those bees? You can see here that some of the flowers, like the Allium and the Achelia, fared very well after this fire. The shrubs don't, of course, but in the Great Basin, very few of the shrubs are bee pollinated. Most of them, like sagebrush, for instance, or horseweed, are all wind pollinated. But the, a lot of the wildflowers are bee pollinated, but the fires come through late in the year. And by that time, because of the life cycle you just saw and the fact that they nest underground, they're out of harm's way. So on the left-hand side is a pie chart of the fauna of bees before, the, before fires sampled at the Stragos Philippines that local weed pictured down below there, sometimes called the salt milk fetch, and on the right, after the fire. And the only bees who are diminished some are in the gray wedge, and those are bees of the genus Osmia, a portion of which either nest shallowly in the ground, and by that I mean just an inch or two underground, or the one that was in the cow path, or in junipers. And so some of them lose out with fire, but most of them persist through the fire to emerge the next year. My graduate student and technician and I, he being Byron Love, have been working at this for quite a while. This was a three-year-old fire, maybe four-year-old fire in eastern Nevada. And you can see the white is Astragalus philippines, the blue is lupin, the yellow, I believe, in that picture is balsamoriza. And you can see it's quite a nice layout for a bee. In these surveys, I show you this not to read the whole thing in detail, but some of them we have very good um, representation. So for instance, Astragalus philippines, we've sampled from 61 sites, 11,000 plants that we've looked at, at which we've surveyed over 1,000 bees. So we're quite confident in knowing its bee fauna. Other ones I'll talk to you about, like Facilia hostata, I'm still learning its bee fauna. The way we collect our bees, our sampling, is we do haphazard transects in which we count every flowering plant as we walk and then catch any bee that's on them. But we count the flowering plant, whether it has a bee on it or not. And so at the end, we can get a density estimate of bees per 100 plants for each of these plant species listed on the left. You can see that some of them are quite uh, abundantly visited. Facelia hostata, which also gets a diversity of bees, Lomatium dissectum, or um, a biscuit root, fern leaf biscuit root, which gets a very limited fauna of very dedicated specialist bees. I want you to notice at the bottom of that list, the least attractive plants we've worked with so far are blue flax, or Lewis's flax in this case, and western yarrow. And that's important because, as you'll see a little, in a little bit, these two plants are the ones that are most commonly used as the only wildflowers in seed mixes for large-scale post-fire seedings in the Great Basin. The flax in particular can be spectacular, as you can see in that picture in the Devil's Run fire. And the uh, yarrow is a very a durable plant and responds well to seeding and is tough and to some extent can even compete with cheatgrass. This is a busy chart. I'm going to simplify it for you and guide you through limited parts of it. But it gives you an idea, not a full idea, but it gives you an idea of what our samples look like. So across the top, we go from in alphabetical order from the yarrow, Achelia, to globe mallows, Feralsia. And the columns 
in the rows of the columns are the proportions of each of those bee genera that we get at each of those plants. Now, of course, in a full chart, we have it by bee species. The darker the blue, the greater proportion of the fauna is represented by bees of that particular genus. I can remove some of these for comparative purposes because they're only um, visiting one plant species. And so they're not very informative for comparing what plants are sharing pollinators. When we simplify it like this, look over to the left first, that first column for the western yarrow, Achelia millifolium. And what you'll see is that there's only two genera of bees attracted to it for the most part. The Helictus, it's four species. They're a broad generalist. It's one of the most generalized bees we have. They go to everything. And the Andrina, although it's a huge genus, it's only a few species of Andrina that go to western yarrow. So as you saw earlier, it attracts very few bees, and the fauna it does attract is a fairly simple fauna. You'll also notice as you look across those rows, especially at the Helictus, that Helictus is not prevalent in most of the other guilds of bees that visit the other wildflowers. Let's look at flax. In the middle there, right down the center, again circled in yellow, flax attracts a greater diversity of bees, Again, a bunch of those helictus because they're generalists. That's true also the lazy glossum are generalists, and a few osmia. So it's a little bit better for bees. However, no bee species, I don't believe any one bee species can make it on flax alone. Maybe some of the helictus can, none of the others can. They're stray visitors who come by for little pollen or nectar at times. So it's helpful to have in a seed mix, but it's not going to serve as a pollinator-friendly plant for seed mixes. So, to recap again, there's the list of attractive plants and what bees think of them in terms of intensity of visitation on a per plant basis. Yarrow and flax, therefore, are sort of like this for the child's diet. They will use them if they have to, but they are not very interested in them. So what are the other options, all those other ones I had in the list? I've work with the pollination biology of most of them. I have samples, sometimes limited, sometimes extensive samples of the bees that visit them. Most of these have also been successfully grown, either at experiment stations, at plant material centers, or already being grown commercially by um, skillful farmers. Almost all of them need a pollinator, or all of them benefit from a pollinator. Most of them need a pollinator, and in all cases, a pollinator is going to be a bee, a group of bees, and in a few cases, like the penstemon and the phacelia, a pollen wasp as well. None of these are pollinated by butterflies. So we'll linger there for a second, because that's quite a taxonomic representation, too. I think there's seven or eight families represented there in very diverse flower morphologies. On farm, um, quite a few of these can be pollinated by honeybees, although you won't see honeybees at them in nature. For instance, the biscuit roots, much to my surprise, were worked by honeybees sometimes, as well as some generalist sweat bees, like those bees of the genus Helictus. So there's some more options that a grower will have that you won't see in the wild. And so to see what pollinates them, you need to see them in cultivation if you're going to make recommendations for how to pollinate them in cultivation. This is a honeybee, um, one of the most versatile pollinators in the world. That's one reason why they're so popular for agricultural use, because they can be used on everything from almonds to zucchini. You can recognize a honeybee by its brown, its orange and brown patterning, by the elbowed antennae, the fact that it carries pollen, like all non-parasitic bees do and that pollen's carried as a pellet on the hind leg, on a smooth kind of spoon-shaped surface on the hind leg. That's distinctive for honeybees and bumblebees. It's the only bees that you'll see with that kind of arrangement in North America. Bumblebees are the other group that have that kind of an arrangement on their hind leg. You can see it in the upper left and the lower right, also carrying a pellet, a, mo a pellet moistened with nectar on the hind leg. And 
And the advantage of this system in a social bee is that they can kick off that pellet as a unit rather than having to brush off pollen. All of our bumblebees are big and fuzzy, but you need to see this characteristic because there are bees who look like bumblebees who want you to think it's a bumblebee so that you think it has the sting of a bumblebee. And again, there's that surface where the pollen pellet is carried. Bumblebees are fairly diverse in the Great Basin, especially at mid and upper elevations. And at upper elevations, they're very important pollinators. They're not always easy to distinguish the species on the wing, which is why you have to catch them and pin them out to identify them by key. You can see that some of them visit quite a few different flowering species that we're working with in the Great Basin, like Bombus centralis and especially Bombus huntii, one of the orange-banded ones. And this is a good thing because it means that if you have Astragalus philippes on site and you want to seed, for instance, Hedicerum boreal, bumblebees will simply move over to the Hedicerum boreal as well and continue to pollinate that. So pollinator sharing is very helpful for adding back species that are missing from a given landscape. You'll notice that these bumblebees are not visiting yarrow or flax. It's not in that list. Another interesting bee genus, these are solitary ground nesting bees, a limited number of species, but they're often common, as you'll see, is bees in the genus Eucera. And you'll notice with these Latin names that for solitary bees, the genus often is fairly, looks, is pronounced the way it looks. So Eucera, pretty easy, easy to type too. This bee is is recognizable in the males. They have a yellow face, which some bees, other bees do. But look at the length of the antennae on that male in the upper picture. They're about as long as the body. And that combination you're not going to see in most other bees in the Great Basin. So long antennae are the longhorn bees in the genus Eucera. They also carry their pollen not wet but dry in a brush of hairs on the hind leg. And that will allow you to distinguish them from a bumblebee, even if they look like a bumblebee to you. But hair in a brush of hairs on the hind leg is dry pollen. That's distinctive. Here you can see another list. These are the species of Eucera that we have. And they're all the numbers that we've caught at the different flower hosts. And of course, remember the Stragos philippines, we've collected a lot of bees at it. But this is almost a quarter of all the bees we've collected as Dragos philippes are represented by the genus Eucera. Again, like the bumblebees, you can see there's a fair amount of sharing going on here. And again, like the bumblebees, you'll see that they don't visit yarrow or flax. So if you have flax seeded, it's not going to help multiply these bees for subsequent pollination of, say, Phacelia hostata or balsam root. Now, Beth Ledger has some convincing competition studies from there at the University of Nevada at Reno that shows that it's the tiny flowered annuals that show up right after some fires in the Great Basin that are, in fact, the most competitive with cheatgrass. They're very desirable that way. Unfortunately, unlike in the warm deserts, all of these are tiny flowered species that I'm aware of, or most of them are. You'll see a few exceptions. And they've got their challenges. Um, Amsinchia, fiddlehead on the right there, is toxic to livestock, and we can't have that on public lands because they're contract grazed. And the other ones are so short statured and tiny that it's not obvious how they're going to be grown for seed for co and commercial mechanical harvest. In addition, um, the Amsinchia gets some bee visits, but these other ones I rarely see bees visiting them. They're they're plants that are made to get up after a fire, set seed, whether there's much in the way of bees or not, and move on and lay down a seed bank for the next fire. There are a few annuals that are very useful for bees in the Great Basin and elsewhere. Sunflowers are spectacular for bees. Um, the, in the western U.S., 250 species of bees have been recorded at sunflower, including a number of specialists. And there you can see also in that picture the other group of bees related to Eucera whose males also have long antennae. Those are Melisodes. They're very much a summer flying bee, whereas the Eucera is spring flying. On the left, you have Cleome. Cleome lutea, the Nevada 
bee plant or jackass clover, as well as um, Cleome cerulata, which has purple flowers, are both really good for anything that wants nectar out there. This anthophora is also collecting pollen while it hovers, but any nectar feeders like these plants because they produce it prodigiously. So they're real nice to have in a seed mix to come up and flower the first year. Most all the rest are herbaceous perennials. Some of the legumes are I show here for restoration in the Great Basin or in the Rocky Mountains. The northern sweet fitch, Hedysrum boreal, goes all the way from northern New Mexico to Alaska. has a fantastic fauna of bees. Um, it's just a great plant, and I like it as a garden plant. We have it at our house. It's in commercial production with na several native seed growers. One of them down in southwestern um, Colorado has 60 acres of it in production. A friend of mine, the late Rick Dunn, had 16 acres of it in production for over a dozen years over in western Wyoming. Astragalus philippes in the lower left is in commercial production as well. Among the local weeds, it's unusual in that it lacks the loco toxins, which is why BLM and Forest Service would be willing to seed it on public rangelands. The dahlias at the lower right are um, taken together, cover a large area of the Great Basin and into the Columbia Plateau, the Snake River Plains, and the Colorado Plateau. Um, I think they've been displaced from a lot of places they used to be because they're very palatable to livestock. The only one who's troublesome here, lupin, of course, is widespread, and there's a number of species that bees use, but most of them have ballistic seed dispersal, as my little animation up there shows. And therefore, how, uh, and that combined with uh, progressive pod maturation means that a grower is really vexed on how to harvest that seed. This shows the list of bees from Astragalus philippes. It's a long list. And what you, I particularly want you to see is for the genus Osmia, which I've presented to you a little bit already, look at the long list of species. That's a quarter of all the Osmia species in North America can be found visiting just Astragalus philippes. It's a phenomenal plant for that. You also notice there's quite a list of bumblebees, too. So that genus Osmia, there's not a great way to recognize all the members of that genus. Some of them are bright metallic green or blue. Some are black. They vary somewhat in size. They're distinctive in that the family to which they belong, the Megachylidae, carry their pollen not on the hind leg, but underneath the abdomen in a brush of hairs. You can kind of see it in the bee on the upper left, who's at a sunflower, or it may be a balsamoriza flower. That bee's a specialist on the Asteraceae. But if you see a bee carrying pollen under its abdomen, and it's colorful, then it's going to be an osmia. And we have quite a, a rich diversity of them. And they also have a diversity of nesting habits, depending on the species. Another ground nester that you can see commonly at globe mallow, which collectively the globe mallows are found all through the Great Basin and down through the warm deserts, is this bee in the genus Diadasia. Again, a fairly phonetic name. You notice the hairs on the abdomen look kind of dusty. It's uh, fairly distinctive. And you notice that bee is carrying a, well, maybe you know, it's carrying pollen dry in a big brush of hairs on the hind leg. And several species in this genus, Diadasia, are specialists on globe mallows. They make distinctive nests with a little turret on the top, a little cylinder of moistened soil that dries as a little chimney, like you can see on the left. They're excellent pollinators of globe mallow, and they will colonize sites where globe mallow is being grown, like here at the Malheur Experiment Station in the center picture. They also will nest gregariously, and at times you will find whole nesting aggregations with these little chimneys all through them. And if you see those chimneys, it's a good likelihood there's diadasia, although there's other ones that make these. Another species of diadasia is a specialist on the aster family, and there's several of them who are specialists on cactus. Pacilia and penstemon, excellent bee plants. Penstemons typically are visited by a couple of species of osmia, as well as those pollen wasps I showed you earlier. Some of the big flowered species are also visited by bumblebees. Pacilia is a widespread genus in the western US. And you're probably used to seeing a 
Basilia hostata with kind of dirty white flowers, which is the common morph. This is one that was isolated and propagated by the Plant Materials Center in Montana that they were using for mine site reclamation in Montana. And it has these lovely lavender flowers. And you can see in cultivation, there's more flowers than leaves. Great bee plant. And I imagine um, our lab uses Facelia tanacita folia in our greenhouses for rearing all sorts of bees. So it's a good genus. Although, as I mentioned, many of the shrubs in the Great Basin, especially at low elevations, are wind pollinated, there's some exceptions. In the fall, rabbit brush is a spectacular bee plant for any bee who's still active in late summer or early fall. So queen bumblebees and holictus, those social bees whose future queens are out and about trying to fatten up before wintering, are there, as well as all manner of other bees. Really great plant for that. And seeds commercially available. It's wild harvested. And it's often used in seed mixes. The other one, which you're never going to plant by seed, but by cutting, are willows. And from what we're learning, many of the willows are good bee plants. I don't know about coyote willow. I have my suspicions it may not be. But Booth's willow and Scowler's willow, for instance, in our area, we have good collections from them. And they're very avidly visited by whatever early spring bees are out and about. So for riparian restoration, make sure they're in your mixes. The other challenge is cows. And I've seen ranches in which there's a diverse flora, big ranches. And I've seen ranches that are fairly chewed to nubbins, like this one is. All of these forbs that are being used by the BLM for restoration seedings are ones that are not toxic to cattle. And therefore, they're palatable. You can see all the nipped ends of flowering racemes on that Astragalus philippes on the right. That was by the herd on the left. And that happened the day after we did our bee surveys. So one may want, need to exclude cows for a handful of years until the plants are well established before they're reintroduced, and then not overstock them. I'd also recommend, if it's going to be a sparse amount of expensive seed in a seed mix, that it be clumped. Obviously, that's not a restoration seeding on the right. That's just natural from a really good winter precip year with the globe mallows. But if if your seeding is going to be such you're going to be planting one plant every 30 feet or every 100 feet, it's better to clump them up in, in localized situations where the, so, the good match for soil type for that species. Because a clumped site will attract more bees and you'll get a lot more cross-pollination out of it. So there's the conclusions from what I've just been telling you. Um, and a lot of these bees, if you live in a place that's not too far into a city, you'll see some of these native bees. Their propensity to colonize in urban or suburban settings or rural settings varies with the species. But you can get to see them in your own yard. And they're not limited to native wildflowers. For instance, um, you could use Maximilian sunflower and, or Gaylardia and, or Mexican hat, and many of these same bees would be happy with that. Most of the wildflowers that we traditionally have been seeding are limited, a limited list, and none of them are good for bees. Yarrow, flax, burnet. They have other values, and I wouldn't leave them out of seed mixes, especially because the seed's relatively cheap. But we need to be adding some of these other species to our wildflower seed mixes if we're really going to benefit our native bee faunas. I'll end on this note. For those of you who have not tried using online the Intermountain Region Herbarium Network, you can see the, the very simple um, URL down there at the bottom, the website address. It, it, you'll get lost in it. It's so much fun. It's a joy to use. It combines the data lists from herbaria, I think 30 different herbaria in the Intermountain West, all the way from Cochise County down in southern Arizona, at least up to here and maybe to the universe, to Montana State. And you can search it very easily. It was designed by a herbarium curator who also knows computer programming. And you can search it. You can bring up maps of all the locales for all the herbarium specimens for a given species, like here, Pensman speciosus. And you can mouse over any one of those and get specific collecting information. And also data entry, once you have permission to do it, is also nice. It's a, just a wonderful thing to use. 
So, some of you may be jumping out of your chairs with questions, maybe, and I'd be more than happy to host whatever questions you have now. Wonderful. I appreciate it. Go ahead. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, the first question is from Diane Pavic. Even if the shrubs are wind pollinated, do bees use the pollen from the shrubs for food? In general, no. And that's because the pollen from those shrubs, general wind pollinated plants in general, the pollen is of a low nutritional value, especially they're low in protein. There are exceptions. Uh, oaks, the pollen of oaks is rather nutritious, and there are bees who will use oak pollen. And then it's a mixed bag as to what willows or what proportion are wind pollinated. Same things for rabbit brush. And in both of those cases, they're useful. But most of them, they are not. And none of them produce nectar. OK, great. Thank you. Linda Booty asks, I would, I would appreciate the information for garden plant species. Thank you. So um, how, how can people get a hold of you? Or should I direct them to me, and then I'll forward their emails to you? Um, they could email me at jim. Okay, I may be able to find it because you'll still be able to see my screen yeah. if I found it and brought it up there. Yeah. Why don't I do that okay. while we answer the next question? So. I think I should be able to okay. close out this presentation. Yeah, and I'll bring it up so they can find see it, and Great. then um, I can answer some other questions in the meantime. Wonderful. Thank you. Richard Easterly asks, are other Areogonum species as attractive as the one you listed? Specifically, how about Areogonum nivium? The Areogonums we don't know well. Is nivium that little, very fine, wispy Areogonum? Is that right? Uh, he'll have to type With in. tiny flowers. There's some of them that are like that that I never see bees at. And the Areogonums are highly variable between species. I, I don't think I have a good feel for the genus as a whole. On the one hand, there's some, there's one in California that's a spectacular bee plant. On the other hand, there's one that I was looking at um, while hiking down out of the Wind Rivers, and I looked at 600 plants in flower, and I saw one parasitic bee, and that was it. So. They wouldn't be at the top of my list, and I don't think they have specialists, but they are very much worth considering in a seed mix. And there's a lot to be learned for which species are the more attractive. Great. Uh, Molly Boyder was saying that the um, Ariaganum nivium is an early cereal buckwheat uh, with small whitish leaves, and it grows low to the ground. Yeah, that one I don't think is very attractive. Because um, I think we're talking about the same. Oh, I'm thinking of Viminium. I'm sorry. Viminium is not very attractive to bees. This other one I don't know so well. So this, are you seeing this web page? Utah Pests Fact Sheet? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you can you also see the URL? Yes. Up here? Uh -huh. That's the URL. But if you just search native bee, gardening native bees Utah, this address will come up. And at the bottom of it, besides giving some biology, and this is for the whole US, but you'll know which ones to pick out of it, is a list of 200 genera, their common names, um, the U is a Utah native, their growth forms, and other notes about them that you can pick from. And I also highlight or boldface the ones that are particularly good bee plants that you can start picking and choosing from these. And I'd be very interested in knowing any other genera that I don't have listed there that you find are attractive to bees other than honeybees. Fantastic. Thank you. That's great. OK, uh, next question. Jesse Brunson asks, we don't have Astragal Astragalus philippes in the northern Colorado Plateau, so I'm wondering if another large statured Astragalus might be good for pollinators as well. Your thoughts? The, the tall stature for this plant is the, the two reasons why this one's being used in the Great Basin is one, the tall stature, which makes it possible to combine the plants for seed using a, a mechanical combine. The other reason is that it lacks the toxins for livestock. 
almost all of the astragalus species are attractive to one or another groups of native bees. Uh, it's somewhat the size of the flower to some extent dictates whether it's going to be mostly bumblebees and anthophora or these osmia, but pretty much any astragalus that you can lay your hands on will serve very nicely, at least in the garden setting, for bees or for limited restoration. The one thing to remember with all those hard-seeded legumes is be sure to scarify the seed before you plant it or else it won't come up for years. Um, do you want to just state it? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know uh, how to pronounce it. Oh, canadensis. Oh, astragalus canadensis. I don't know that one, but I would think it most... I, the astragalus that don't attract bees will be the exception. Okay. I don't know of ones that don't. Um, one other aside with astragalus is that astragalus also attracts a diversity of bees. I know from a Swiss colleague who did work in northern Iran, where their astragalus, many of them are woody and spiny, and they also attract a bevy of bees, as does, as does species of Hedicerum there. So it's a, both of those are worldwide genera that um, are popular with bees. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Pamela Pavic asks, which species besides yarrow and flax have the most reliable establishment and restoration plantings? The others that I know of, Pam, are the non-natives. So the small burnet always seems to work. Um, they also use alfalfa. There's alfalfa varieties which have been to a limited extent selected for their rugged nature for growing out in the sage steppe, and they will feed bees, although everything else will eat them too. For reliable reliability and establishment, at least the, the limited number of burns I know where they've used them, the globe mallows sometimes do better, and I have seen some of the penstemons do okay in those. The penstemons, because of their tiny seed, requires that they not be planted with a seed drill, but rather with a no-till drill like the Rough Rider that um, has been designed and is, BLM owns a number of them now. And that one can put the seed, just press it into the soil so those little tiny seeds can get up. We're doing some research right now looking at whether we could improve establishment either under floating row cover, as Scott Jensen has used for a number of years for Forbes, for um, common garden work, and we're also exploring with some snow fences custom made to make drifts, particularly for restoration purposes, to see if we can't give them a wet winter precip year every year rather than um, hit and miss with our seedings. But that's, that's the big stumbling block right now, is being more successful with establishment in the field. Great, thank you. Lynn Kenter asks, in my native wildflower garden and landscaping, I've left the old stems without pruning well into the spring in case insects are overwintering there. How much of a concern is this? And when in the spring and when in the spring is it safe to prune and tidy up the landscaping without risking killing the insects? Excellent question. I'm glad you're aware of that and observant because there are bees who will use some of that and we leave we, in our own yard, we leave, um, I always leave, uh, I have um, red raspberries and blackberries, and I, the red raspberries I prune off at 10 inches instead of pruning them to the ground and just leave them. And at this point, there's a native bee genus, the small carpenter bees, genus Serotina, or tiny little bees, and I have one in almost every single cut stem right now. Two things you can do. One of them is leave them through the winter, when you do cut them, cut them low and pile them somewhere on their sides or not upside down, but on their sides or the like. And whoever is wintering in there can come out on their own and they may reuse them. Mm -hmm. I'd also suggest for, and keep an eye open because I'm still learning, um, there's the um, Japanese iris, its old flowering stems, these serotina also nest in those. And that picture I had early on of a one green cavity nester, that was in cut stems of uh, big stems of forsythia, which turns out have a little hollow inside, and once they dry over a summer, they're then reusable by bees for a couple of years. So if you can 
keep an eye open for those and stash them to one side. Bees will find them and use them, and meanwhile they'll be out of your way in the garden itself. Great, thank you so much. All right, that looks like the last question. Thank you all for your participation. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon, and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. Our next webinar, Restoring Shrub Step After Wildfire, Shrub Planting as a Vi Viable Tool in Rehabilitation with Heidi Newsom, will take place next Tuesday, the 22nd. And I, it's been brought to my attention that the registration link on our website is broken, and so I will also fix that um, immediately after this webinar as well. If you have further questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me at any time. Thank you again for your par participation today, and thank you so much, Jim, for your presentation. Thank you all for your patience and, and sitting there and listening during your lunch hour. <laughs> all right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye.